the button. Here we go. Good evening, everybody. Um, we are going to be talking tonight about archery deer hunting. So I have opened up the webinar and all the attendees are coming in and I look forward to having this webinar. We have some really good presenters tonight and it's very appropriate for the time of the uh, year and the season that we talk about archery deer hunting because uh, this weekend, actually the A-Zone opens up for uh, the year. So some of you may be actually out there trying to, you know, go out there and sling an arrow and catch your prize. I don't mean to say catch as in fish, but uh, get your prize. I always hate when my wife says, hey, did you catch anything when I go out hunting? She does say that quite frequently, or she used to. But anyways, tonight we're going to uh, have uh, three presenters on screen with us, and they're going to, they have very uh, vast experience with archery. Um, tonight, we're going to use um, the question and answer function. Again, we have some panelists that will be able to answer some of those, or we will answer them live when you ask them. Uh, also, you can use the chat, but we prefer that most thing goes through the question and answer. Uh, I actually do have a survey question that um, doesn't have a specific answer. I ask it to maybe chat your specific answer in the chat function. So that will really help us um, to capture, you know, hey, uh, that's, this is how I want to answer that survey question. So once again, uh, thank you for joining us. Next um, webinar will be on July 22nd. It will cover public A-zone opportunities um, for A-zone deer. Uh, as I said, the archery season opens up this weekend. So we're gonna be primarily focusing on the remainder of the archery season, which will be very short after that actually. And the general season, which will be opening up the second week of August. So trying to get you some information about A-zone uh, where you can go. It's one of our largest zones in the in the state. And um, there are a lot of private land holdings within that A zone, but there are some good public areas. So, so we will talk about that at that time. All right. As many of you know, we have a pretty good participant at the level I was expecting. Um, maybe some more will come in here in a little bit. But I always like to start off our webinars with a poll. And uh, again, with the polls, I have attached a couple of jokes so you can tell me whether they're funny or not and uh, maybe get a good chuckle. I'm gonna allow our panelists to also vote on this. So here comes the poll. Okay, have you ever bow hunted? Yes or no? And here's the joke. Why did the man decide to quit his old job and go hunting full time? Because he heard deer hunters get huge bucks. Not the greatest, but if you smile and look funny, then you're, uh, you know, hey, it worked what it was supposed to do. It's just an icebreaker. So I'm gonna allow it uh, three more seconds here for polling. Uh, three, two, one. See a lot of people participating. I think, thank you for that. So here's our results, uh, panelists. You can see that we have about 60% that have bow hunted and 40% that have not. And most of them like my joke, 86%, that's not bad. All right, so we're gonna launch a new poll. Let's see, how do I do this again? Cancel. Let me see, where are my polls? Okay, there they are. I think I've been doing this for a while. Here's regards to interest, and here's the poll. What are the top three reasons for your interest in archery deer hunting? So pick three. Uh, the challenge, increased opportunities, like shooting a bow, extends my hunting season, less hunting pressure, see more animals, ammunition is too hard to get, and like buying new toys. So pick your top three there. Archers are famous for wanting to get the latest and greatest, kind of like phone buyers. You know, they want the latest bow because it's quicker, faster, whatever. Uh, so some people might fall in that category. So pick your top three, please. Just curious to what your uh, reason for getting uh, interested in deer hunting with uh, archery equipment. And my joke, I might as well read it. <laughs> what did Homer Simpson say when he ran over a 
deer. No. <laughs> All right. Not as many people like that joke as the last one. And I'm going to close it here. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, share my results. So the top two uh, reasons for, for archery deer hunting or the challenge and extends my hunting season. Uh, the other ones that are high are less hunting pressure and uh, increased opportunities. All right. Yeah, the increased, increased opportunities, uh, you know, could come from being able to hunt areas that people don't want you to hunt with uh, firearms, but they don't mind you hunting that area for with a bow. So that's that's nice to to have. All right. So got some there. Oh, somebody said I look like a homer. That's not nice. I'm gonna have to take care of that person. I was, I was gonna say I thought the best part of the joke was right. That it was, was well, oh my gosh, I, I know that guy. Himself. I'm gonna have to have a talk to him. All right, my last poll. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate that. Barriers. <clears throat> what is your biggest fear of trying archery deer hunting? Uh, wound, just one one pick. Uh, wounding an animal, being in the forest without a firearm buying the equipment, not liking it or being good at it, or other, please pl chat your reason. <clears throat> and then my last joke, did you hear the one about the buck who shed its antlers? Oh, never mind, it's pointless. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I didn't ever launch the poll. Yeah. <laughs> uh, somebody's supposed to tell me that. So here we go. It'll give you some time to vote on it. You got to hear the joke. So here's your choices. Uh, again, what is your biggest fear of trying archery deer hunting? Wounding an animal, being in the forest without a firearm, buying the equipment, not liking it or being good at it, and, or other. <clears throat> and the reason I'm reading these is because these polls don't show up in the recordings. So I want people to understand what we're asking. And you know that way they have a... a um, involvement with the poll also and then my joke this one's coming out better the top joke i saved it for last thank you for for participating and here we go all right so the biggest fear is wounding an animal all right and 95 percent thought my joke was funny so thank you i hope you guys are enjoying that part uh um that we're actually i'm actually incorporating I want to break the ice. I want you guys to feel like you're all part of our family here and we're having a good time, just a good conversation. So please uh, participate in that aspect. So a couple of the other reasons I hear, I see is hunting uh, during warm weather. That is definitely a concern. Um, Joe told me no pull was available. A disability, not being able to pull and hold the bowstring. Uh, that, that is another good reason. Scaring the animals away too early. Uh, maybe giving them that. Some people are worried about pressuring the animals before the general season. Uh, much harder to hunt with a bow, sometimes frustrating due to less range. Yeah, yeah, that's the challenge. That's what some people really like. So I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you for participating. I, I really enjoy and we're, we're using your results to figure out what we're going to be doing tonight. So thank you. All right, gentlemen, what'd you think of those polls? Did you see anything revealing? Just yeah, to, yeah, to the guy that's, um, the, the, the gentleman here, uh, and I, I, I don't want to butcher his name, so I'll call him Mr. G, uh, talking about disability, not being able to pull and hold a bowstring. Obviously, keep in mind that there are certainly opportunities for, uh, for disabled archers, um, and you may not be thrilled about the idea of hunting with a, with a crossbow, but uh, with the proper paperwork in the state of California. Certainly, hunt, uh, during archery season on an archery tag with a crossbow, if you do have some sort of a yeah. shoulder ailment, or 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 you perhaps you're completely disabled uh, in some way. So think about that. Yeah, there's um there's the opportunity for uh, and here I go again. I probably displaying the wrong seat, uh, slide. Um, what are you seeing right now, gentlemen? I'm sorry, I archery usually... deer hunting your first slide. Okay, so you're not seeing my uh, notes page. Where am I at? 
I full just slide. Did archery hunting in the next slide in a smaller screen. Okay, so yeah, I am on the wrong one. Let me see. Uh, it is your notes page, Sean. Yeah, here we go. Is this better? That's the first page. Yeah. yeah. All right. Looks good. Thank you. All right, so let's get going on this. So our first presenter um, is Lieutenant Michael Pasco. Uh, Pasco or Pasco? Why do you say it, Mike? Pasco. Pasco, sorry. Yeah. Just Mike like do not with... Pasco, go straight to jail. <laughs> Mike is uh, with our department, but he does have 25 years of law enforcement. He's a current supervisor in Lake County, and he has been shooting bows since 1986. Uh, Mid-90s, he started shooting recurves and long bows exclusively. He does have a first place trophy somewhere in his man cave there probably. And uh, he's been a hunter ed instructor since 2007 and becoming a bow hunter ed in 2015. Uh, he's assisted with advanced bow hunter ed clinics and always encouraging hunters to spend as much time in the field as possible. And let me tell you, Mike is a very good trainer. So if you ever have the opportunity to take one of his classes, please do. Our next presenter is uh, Lieutenant Ian Barry, who is a skipper, and he's actually with us right now from his boat out in, uh, what did, where did you say it was? In San Pablo Bay, anchored up right now. San Pablo Bay. He's, he's broadcasting live from San Pablo Bay. He's been hired, uh, he was hired in 2010 after he completed his BS in biology, and that does stand for biological sciences. <laughs> uh, he has been shooting bows since 1992, at mostly compounds. And he likes to hunt deer and take backpack trips where he goes deep into the backcountry. Uh, he also enjoys shooting 3D targets with his son and hopes to get his son his first buck this year. Welcome for, uh, to our webinar, Ian. And then our last presenter, not least, he's our uh, first person I actually asked to, to, to join me. He is um, Chris Bowles, that is yes with two S's. Uh, he's married to the father of two. Uh, he's from, originally from Missouri, uh, he's been out here for a while. He's a 16 year member at the Aronco Bowman. Is that what it is? Yeah, Aronco. All right, and he's currently the president of the California Bow Hunter, uh, California Bowman Hunter State Archery Association. Um, he has taught Hunter Ed and Bow Hunter Ed since 2013 and he runs two programs for our Bow Hunter, uh, Hunter Ed program at Rahagi's and Prado Olympic Shooting Park. So welcome, uh, Chris. All right, so let's get to the first slide and what we're here for tonight. We're talking about California archery deer hunting. And the reason why that I wanted to uh, cover this is first off, uh, archery deer season starts this weekend. A zone is the first season to start in California. It usually starts on the second Saturday of July. Um, but A, B and D zones have archery seasons prior to the general hunt season also. And you are eligible to hunt that archery season if you have the general A, B, or D zone tag. So if you acquired a D6 or D17, whatever that tag is, um, you can go out bow hunting during the archery only season. There or the archery season, which usually precedes uh, the general. California also offers uh, 28 separate area specific archery hunts. And those are usually denoted as an A1, A3, A32, whatever it may be. Um, but those are usually hunts in specific areas like the C zone or the X zone, or maybe a, a, a prime uh, hunt that uh, is in a rut area where you're allowed to have this extra opportunity to maybe bag a, a really monster buck that's in the rut and they're out there chasing does. So there's some really good opportunities for, for that type of hunt uh, through the A hunts, the archery only hunts. And then the last uh, option for some of the archery hunters is you've got some other general tag, but you, you can buy a second deer tag. An archery only tag will allow you to hunt uh, the archery and general seasons in A, B, and D zones and G10 if you're a military. Um, but it'll allow you to hunt during the archery seasons or during the general season, but only with archery equipment, okay? Not crossbows, unless you have a disability permit, but it's only archery equipment, which is just a regular bow and arrow. And uh, that's, that's a good tag to get if uh, maybe one of the 
D zones that you wanted uh, closed. You didn't get a tag for it, but the storm's coming in. Uh, you'll be able to have an opportunity to buy an archery only tag and go out there and, and join, the, join the fun. But why should you bow hunt? We're gonna talk about that tonight. Um, get you more time in the field. Uh, you may have a first chance to encounter game in the first season. Uh, I can't see my screen, so um, I'm just going off of memory on this. Um, <clears throat> it will allow you to bow hunt multiple zones on one tag, if you get the eight uh, archery only tag. It provides an extra challenge. It provides a different experience. That's a big one. And there are some late season options available in hunts that are designated either sex, which means you can harvest a doe if you see one uh, or a buck. And then a couple of archery only area specific hunts go into late December. So if you want that opportunity to hunt late into the year, you wanna avoid the heat, uh, this is an opportunity for uh, you to hunt with archery equipment and hunt during that time of year. Um, Mike, you have any other additions that you would like to add to that? On this slide, those would pretty much cover it for me. How about you, Ian? I, I just enjoy the practice of archery and it gives me something because I enjoy shooting my bow. I enjoy target shooting so much. It gives me a goal to work towards every year that I have a hunt I'm working towards. And it helps me really focus my my other passion of hunting with the target shooting of the archery. And it, it, it's pretty fulfilling that way. Perfect. How about you, Chris? Do you have another reason why? Uh, I mean, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm, these guys are not a lot to cover on these uh, on these particular slides. Uh, you know, the only thing I would tell folks out there, you know, depending on you know whether you've actually gone after the draw on archery tags before is uh, just you know, obviously make sure with your first and second deer tag you're putting in for you know the best coolest hunts you can get um because there is always the ao tag after it's all over with <laughs> which, yeah. which uh, yours truly will be hunting this year uh you know, and, and you know there's nothing wrong with that it gives you a lot of opportunities to hunt that yeah. but you know the archery tags are going to give you a huge opportunity to to hunt a variety of areas and also a lot of uh, a lot of time in the field versus just having to go out for one week or Know, and try to get, get all right. Those are all good reasons. And, and myself, uh, archery practice is relaxing. I mean, uh, it's a lot different than going to the range and shooting a gun where you're pounding, you got to wear earmuffs. Archery practice is quite relaxing. So I would add that to it too. All right. Yeah. The other bonus uh, on that note, as far as the shooting aspect of it is uh, you get to reuse your ammunition over and over again. So <laughs> Yeah. No reloading, nothing. You just walk down range, pick it up, and get to start all over. But the ammunition is expensive, right? Initially. All right. So what do you need to go? Yeah, uh, what do you need to go archery deer hunt? Well, you need a hunting license and a valid deer tag for where you're going to hunt. You might also want to consider getting a bear tag too. Um, you need a bow with no less than 30 pounds in draw weight. Your arrows matched. We'll get into that a little bit later. Shall have broadhead type blades, which will not pass through seven eighths inch hole in diameter. You need to practice, practice, practice. Okay, we're gonna talk about that probably at length also um, for multiple positions and multiple distances. And as I mentioned, uh, razor sharp broadheads, razor sharp, okay. Um, make sure you use a practice set or an old set that you're no longer using for hunting just to make sure that your arrow is responding to your setup the way that you want. Uh, anything I left out of there, guys, you know, you know, we're going to talk about what, what would be another thing that they might want to know. Yeah. As far as the practice stuff goes, uh, I would go even further and say, if you're just getting started right now, try and get some good coaching. I, mean, I was self-taught early on and I was just kind of going by what I saw in movies and TVs and stuff like that. And I had a lot of bad habits. And once I was able to get some really good coaching and see some really top-notch shooters, I was able to completely change uh, my consistency and form and all of that kind of stuff. So um, if you have an opportunity to get out there and uh, get some one-on-one -on -one coaching or have somebody videotape you and, and uh, do some self-critique, it'll, it'll help tremendously to build good solid foundation and uh alleviate some of those bad habits you have to overcome later on very good 
That's uh, that is true. I've been with the department for 22 years, and uh, I went to a training just recently with Mike, where I shot the best I ever shot after 22 years of shooting a pistol uh, due to Mike's training. He really helped me out. So, good training will lead to good results. So, thanks for that, Mike. I'm serious about that. All right. Let me get to the next slide. So helping you get started, we just talked about this, uh, getting some help, professional help, okay? Visit a pro shop. You need to have a, a bow and arrows that are matched with each other and matched to you. Do not be tempted to borrow equipment. Um, borrowed equipment is, is a safety hazard, honestly. Um, practice shooting, practice judging distance, practice shooting from different positions and under phys different physical stresses you are not going to get many shots you didn't work for. Uh, sometimes, you know, you're gonna be crawling through an area, your, your arm's gonna be tired, you're gonna be uh, maybe down on a knee, trying to get underneath the, the trees, the canopy, and, and that might be the shot you're presented. So uh, it's not gonna be standing, uh, you know, straight up to the target and shooting all day that you're gonna get for a, in a hunting situation. So. If you're gonna hunt from a ground blind, practice from a ground blind. Um, the other thing you wanna do is try. Try going through a field or a 3D course, which you will give you shots at targets from different distances, angles, and under different physical exertion. Maybe make this a challenge to yourself that, hey, as soon as I get to the range, after climbing this hill, uh, get to the next station, I'm gonna shoot within the first 10 seconds or something to that effect. Maybe run in place for a little bit. Uh, give yourself that type of option. Anything else you guys can add to this? Let's go with you, Mike. <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't want to step on anybody's uh, toes or steal anybody's thunder, but a couple things. If you're just getting started, we see a lot of people overbow themselves right out of the gate and, and buy a bow that they think that they need uh, for hunting. They end up buying an 80 or 100 pound bow, and it's just way too much for them to learn good form. So uh, go to that pro shop, have them set something up for you and figure out what your comfortable draw is so you can draw straight back without having to really exert and make a lot of movement because movement is what's going to give away, you know, your position to scare a lot of deer off. The other thing too is it'll help you learn that form a lot easier. You'll, you'll hit quicker, your accuracy will improve uh, faster and uh, you'll have more fun, fun with it. And then as far as the practice goes, one of the best uh, pieces of advice that I got specifically for hunting is uh, shooting one arrow at a time. Um, you just draw back and you just concentrate on that one arrow being the only arrow that you shoot per string. It gives your body an opportunity to recover from the shot, uh, your muscles to kind of regain some of the strength. You walk down range, collect your arrow, but it kind of psychologically also prepares you for making that one arrow, the one arrow that uh, matters. So, and the other thing too is, you don't stack arrows on top of each other that last a lot longer as well. Yeah. <clears throat> Ian? Yeah, I just like to reiterate about how important it is, is to get set up properly through someone that knows what they're talking about. It's going to be tempting when you first go find a bow on Craigslist, take it out, shoot it. Especially with compound bows, they're specific to a draw length of your physical geometry. The, the rest needs to be installed properly with the sights, with the peep. All those things come together with your release that if you're not set up properly, it's it's really gonna, you're, you'd be much better off buying a cheaper bow from a professional place having them set up for you than go try and save money on Craigslist. Get properly fitted, get properly matched arrows, the spine of the arrow, if, if there are new phrases to you, the bow shop will know all that stuff, how to set it up properly. And you'll be on much better footing getting set up properly than just trying to cobble together a, a, a bow and arrow, especially with compounds, how those are tuned. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, Mike, uh, somebody had a, a question and it's a good one. What did you mean by stacking arrows? Yeah. So what I meant by stacking arrows is if you shoot multiple arrows and you're getting really good and you're sticking all of those arrows into the same spot over and over again, at some point, one of those arrows is going to hit the back end of another arrow. Here's going to crash an arrow. And, uh, so yeah. pick a separate spot or shoot one arrow at a time. Your arrows will last a lot longer instead of just stacking them right on top of one another yeah. shot after shot. Yeah, you don't want to be, uh, you know, as fun as it might sound, the Robin Hood, when you're talking about uh, shooting straight down the, the, the shaft of another arrow, 
you just messed up in that arrow and they get to be about 12, 14 bucks or 12 to 20. I don't even know what they are nowadays, but they're not cheap. So you don't want to be messing up your arrows while you're there. All right. Um, Chris, any additions to that? We, we've had. Well, you know, I mean, again, I know the guys have uh, gone over the pro shop portion. I, mean, I don't want to, you know, there's never a horse too dead to beat. But, um, you know, I agree with you guys 100 percent. You know, the, the local pro shops are, are definitely a way to go with that. But not only that, all the local, well, I say all, but darn near all the local pro shops are going to give you an opportunity to, to shoot the bow in their 20 yard indoor range, which is going to give you an opportunity to kind of try out a lot of things. And also they're going to offer you the lessons that uh, we're talking about earlier, which, um, you know, if I could, I, you know, guys, guys like to jump into archery hunting by going out and buying a, a compound bow because it's sexy and it's quick and it's easy and it looks good. And they do, and they're good. But, um, I could just recommend, you know, take a couple free lessons with, and in deference to Mike, take a couple lessons with, you know, garden variety recurve bow, just a stick and string. So you can get a feel for an understanding of how arrows fly, how archery is shot, and some of the things that, that go along with uh, learning how to shoot archery. Um, keeping in mind, Fred Bear killed an awful lot of animals with nothing more than a stick and a string. Um, and I, I would say too, that again, the archery shop is gonna also do some things for, again, with the spine of the arrow, but also buying stuff off of eBay and that sort of thing. Get some arrows that are too short, which suddenly becomes a real safety hazard. Yes. Okay. You know, if it dances off the rest on you, and you know, we've seen that the pictures of that going through people's hands. So it's, yeah. you know, you got you want to be careful making sure that you not only got stuff that's gonna fly right, but it's also not gonna be safe for you. Um, practice shooting. Most all your clubs are gonna have a public day. Go to your local archery clubs. Okay, they've got public days. Uh, I know up north, uh, whether it's El Dorado Hills or it's Maya Archers or any of these other great clubs that are up north or down south or the Ranco, Cherry Valley, you know, there's going to be public days where you can go in and get some, some shooting without having to spend a lot of time and money. And then go shoot some 3D tournaments. Like it says down there at the bottom, 3D tournaments are a gas. They're a lot of fun. They're a great way to get together with friends. And they're a great way to, to really knock on your, on your, uh, your distance judgment. Because uh, I can tell you from so many level of experience, it, if you're on a spot and stock, it's not as easy as you would think to get a, a range finder up to your face, range something in, then put it back down, then get it full draw before somebody sniffs you out. So you definitely want to make sure that you've got a good 3D judgment before you get out too far out the field. Perfect. Perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. So another thing you want to think of uh, doing this year, because um, of many reasons, but scouting virtually before you go afield. Uh, when it comes to archery, maybe you have limited time. You want to make your hunt as effective as possible. So make the best use of your time by maybe giving yourself a couple of game plans. If you didn't see the previous webinar uh, that I had last month on virtual scouting, check out our YouTube channel on uh, CDFW's YouTube channel. And I will include a link to it in the links page afterwards uh, so you can get it straight from there. Um, this year especially, it may be more important to know where you are because a lot of the lumber companies that are next to our national forest are closing their normally open properties due to fire risk. So a big one is Sierra Pacific uh, Land and Timber. Um, they're going to let people, you know, drive through any of the roads that are, you know, forest service roads. They can drive through, but they don't want you exiting your vehicle. They don't want you doing any recreational activities on their lands because that's their, you know, that's their company. That's that's what they're in the business for. Uh, they have let, let us hunt in their forest for a long time, uh, but this year with the drought, that's a big issue. And so some of the hunting apps that show land ownership will make help make you game plan a lot better. Make sure you're staying on lands that are open to hunting and keep you out of trouble by, you know, keeping you off those lands that are be closed to be closed. So please check that out. Uh, make, keep yourself safe. Keep yourself out of trouble. Maybe think of uh, purchasing one of those type of apps for your phone, your GPS, whatever it may be. Um, next, we'll talk about equipment. Okay, this is, this is a broad range of stuff. There's all kinds of choices and options out there. Uh, Mike hunts with a recurve only or a longbow. Uh, Ian likes to hunt with uh, compounds. So there's different options for bows, but these are the basic equipment uh, needs that you'll have. And uh, so, 
I'm not sure how we're going to handle this. I'm going to start with you, Chris. I've made you go last a couple of times. I'm going to give you the first opportunity so you're not repeating. Uh, oh, I, I hate to do this to you, but I'm answering one of your uh, chat questions real quick. Tim. Okay. Just, all right. Sorry about that. <laughs> what is a good one? Uh, yeah, it's actually uh, one that comes up a lot. So, okay. uh, you know, actually, I don't mind saying I'll just read it here rather than put my typing skills. So, yeah, go ahead and answer. Uh, you right. know, I've heard I've heard Archer say 60 yards is max bow hunting distance, but I'm an accurate I'm accurate at much greater distances. So in terms of arrow energy, what should be the realistic max range using a compound and carbon arrows for a clean kill? Uh, this is a question that comes up and it's it's it, you know, it's the sixty four million dollar question. Uh, I can tell you and I don't mind using his name. Brett Scott is the owner of Willow Creek Archery down in Escondido killed, you know, state record uh, bighorn sheep from 58 yards. Um, you know, again, he's an excellent shot. Uh, he was shooting 70 pounds. Uh, he was dialed in and, you know, he, he felt very comfortable taking that shot. And he had a nice kill and brought home a great trophy. Uh, and again, a bighorn sheep tag is, you know, it's a holy grail of tags here in California. Uh, again, it's what you're comfortable with. Uh, larger chested animals, elk, uh, you know, again, a, a sheep or a large mule deer, uh, you're, you're going to be looking, you know, there's possibilities you can shoot a lot further. Um, but again, shot placement is every bit of it. Everybody talks about arrow energy. I agree. Uh, you want to get some good arrow energy. You want to make sure you've got a good heavy arrow that you're throwing out there. Um, but again, shot placement is every bit of it. Uh, also keep in mind, though, the further out you shoot it, that's where your blood trail starts. Okay. And again, you're going to leave something out. You're going to shoot something and nail it at 70 yards. Okay. Um, you know, now you're going to sit tight for 30 to 45 minutes, depending on what your comfort level is. Now you're going to go start blood trailing. You got to go out there to that 70 yard mark and try to find things. That can also present a challenge. So again, it's, it's, it's an issue of where you're accurate, where you're comfortable with. That's an ethics question that comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's a $20 answer to a $5 question. <laughs> All right. So, Bose, uh, what particular do you hunt with, Chris? Uh, I'm a I'm a Hoyt guy. Uh, always kind of have been. Uh, you know, Earl Hoyt from St. Louis uh, originally and started Hoyt, now by Easton. Uh, I think they're an excellent bow. Uh, when it comes to compound bows, it's really hard to find a bad one these days. Um, you know, the the kind of the some of the big three that come to mind are going to be Bowtech, Matthews, and, and Hoyt. Uh, you know, Elite makes an excellent bow. Prime makes an excellent bow. Uh, your, your, your archery pro shops, are, they're not going to steer you wrong when it comes down to getting into a nice quality bow. Um, but, you know, that, that's where I'm at with them. I'm a, uh, I'm a dual cam guy. I, I don't really care a whole lot for single cam bows. I've just not been able to tune them as well as I would like to have them. But, you know, I'm a dual cam guy. Uh, you know, the carbon bows are going to feel a lot more dead in hand when it comes down to compound bows. But, you know, any of those that the, the, the local shops have got are, are probably going to be excellent choices for you. Uh, as far as the, the traditional bows, I'm going to let Mike talk about those. Um, just really quick, because I don't have any bow pictures. But when he was talking about a single cam or a double cam, uh, this is a Matthews. If you look, it's a single cam because it has a, a wheel on the top and it has the cam in the back, which is this really odd shaping shaped wheel i guess you could call it but it's a cam and that's where all the energy comes from besides the limbs so um <clears throat> that's what he's talking about in reference to a single cam or a double cam bow a double cam will have two of those odd shaped uh cams at the end of the axles um arrows leanne um can you give them uh, everybody a brief you know, run down on arrows. Sure. Uh, so one of the first things we, we mentioned on another slide was how it's important to match the spine, which is the stiffness of the arrow to the poundage you're shooting. The draw length comes into play with that, how long the arrow is, accounting for those different things. Uh, there's also a material you're gonna hunt with where, you know, back in the day they used wood arrows, then they moved it to aluminum. Lately, uh, most hunters have moved to using a carbon arrow, which is a great arrow. Uh, they can be expensive. They also you need to inspect them regularly for damage because they can be dangerous if they're damaged. They can splinter on you. Uh, I personally shoot a hybrid, an Easton full metal jacket. It's a carbon arrow that's jacketed in aluminum, a real small diameter one, so it gets less wind influence. 
Um, but it all comes together when you build up your arrow to your bow, the whole package, what, what size veins you want on there, what type of broadheads you're using, what type of knocks, all that comes together that what shoots best out of your bow. And it may take quite a bit of playing around to figure out your arrows are flying just right. Yeah. Really quick too, uh, we have the word mechanical and open mode and stuff there. I just wanted to show you some, um, some heads here, some broad heads. Uh, fixed mode, uh, broad head is one that has three, three, two blades, four blades, whatever, but they're always open and, and ready to go. Um, if you look at these two, these are two different types of mechanical broad heads. One's the Rage, which is here on this, uh, this side. It has what they call a back um, deploying, rear deploying blade. Um, when it hits, hits a target, the blades re uh, deploy backwards and creating the, increasing the surface area in which it cuts, okay? This is like an inch and a half or two inch cut uh, that'll have upon entry of the animal. This other one is, kind of what they call a swing back uh, type of deployment where it hits here it'll be really small but as it goes into the animal the blades just uh, kick back and this one has three blades this is actually my turkey gobbler getter that I didn't get to shoot this year but uh, uh, it has three blades that deploy backwards um, after the flipping over uh, not deploying rearward and back okay so there's different options. People like different types of styles. The big key to all these type of mechanical blades is when you shoot them, originally they're gonna fly more like your target tips that you uh, hunting with. All right, Mike, uh, can you give us some rundown on some of the other equipment and some of the stuff that people are gonna consider besides maybe what's there or, or expand on that a little bit? You were completely garbled, I missed it. What can you? Shoot the okay. question again. I'm sorry. Can you go ahead and cover some of the other equipment, such as the releases, the range finders, binoculars, any other type of equipment that uh, people getting into archery hunting could, should consider? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So the sites to, to, with traditional equipment, typically you're going to shoot uh, either by gap, uh, and you guys can research that uh, online. There's a bunch of videos out there covering that. Um, or intuitive, instinctive, um, everything. You know, kind of. Uh, like throwing a softball kind of thing at the beginning of the season. You can kind of get to the first base, but by the end of the season, the more you do it, the more accurate you're going to be. With the compounds, typically, you're going to have uh, some type of uh, pin sight system, typically, and a, a peep in the string that'll help with that alignment, perfect alignment for shot in the uh, different pin set for different ranges. Um, as far as releases go, it's uh, Pandora's box. You, you people, Some people like gloves, some people like tabs, some people like uh, the various release aids that you have up there that kind of wrapped around the wrist um, that you grab onto with your fingers, uh, thumb releases, trigger releases with your index finger. There's a whole world out there for those. So uh, again, going to that pro shop or a club or uh, hanging out with experienced shooters will give you an opportunity to see a bunch of them in action and, and let you pick and choose the pros and cons for each one and, and find what's going to work best for your shooting style, your build and stuff like that. Uh, on the other equipment down at the bottom, one of the most important pieces of equipment that uh, you're going to want as a bow hunter, as a hunter in general, is a really good quality set of binoculars. Um, if you're going to do any type of blasting for an extended period of time, a uh, uh, spotting scope is fantastic too, especially if you're glassing large open areas. But uh, at the very least, um, spend the extra money for really good quality glass. And the good news is, even the budget binoculars today are better than the higher end binoculars of 20 years ago. So um, you can still stay on the lower end of the spectrum and get a decent set of binoculars. Um, but the binoculars are gonna be the tools that allow you to see into the cover um, instead of just trying to see a deer in the open, which is gonna be very difficult. You're gonna have to look through uh, different layers of foliage uh, to catch that ear, to catch that tail flicker. Uh, the antler tine, whatever it is, um, and good quality glass will help define those individual items inside of a, a dark mass. So the more light gathering ability and the clarity, the better off you're going to be. So um, as far as uh, the next piece of equipment, yeah. your bows and, and wall matched arrows and razor sharp pot head, uh, invest in a good quality set of binoculars. 
Good, good quality what? Uh, binoculars. Binoculars, yes, yes. All right. Uh, we had some good questions come in on the chat. Uh, they're not using, ah, sheesh, I keep on messing this up, sorry. Um, that came in on the chat that some of you have been answering. Uh, some people want to know what type of uh, what type of practice targets best for using for the broadheads. And I see that Chris at, at, um, added mortar sand um, being a good opportunity uh, actually, for, for that. Actually, one of the problems you're unfortunately faced with with broadheads, and this is important to know, is that as you get started in archery, uh, broadheads are going to fly, depending on your bow, they're going to fly a little different than your field points that you're normally used to practicing with. Um, keeping in mind, most clubs where you're at are not really going to—they're going to frown on you guys uh, practicing with broadheads in their in their carpet bales and that sort of thing. So you are going to have to find uh, a place to do that. Over to Ranko, we found really a good thing is just mortar sand and just wet it down real good, and it stops them on a dime. You just pull them out, switch them around in a five-gallon bucket of water, and you're ready to roll. The only problem you have with broadheads stuck into a rubber target, which may be your only option, again, the Reinhardt's or Morel's or whatever, is that if they're stuck in there good, again, you're not going to really want to practice with mechanicals because when you do that, as you're trying to pull them back out, you're going to rip the blades off of them. And then if you've got a fixed blade broadhead, like what I use, I, I have to use the Montex to the V5s. You pulling those out, you got a better than average chance of pulling out your insert if you're, if you're not careful just trying to get them back out of the target. So that you know the rubber targets work okay. Um, you know if you can find a place where you've got a, a, a sand pit to, to practice in, it works very very nicely. But again, Reinhardt does a pretty good job with them as does Morel. Somebody also had a question, and uh, I guess they couldn't see when I was holding the arrows uh, the arrows up. Uh, you have as viewers have options to choose your view. Um, some of you might see a full screen where it's just the shared screen. Uh, some of them. Uh, some choices allow you to see the speaker who's actually speaking. And that's what I was assuming that you're watching. Uh, so, you know, I was holding up some mechanical heads. You can watch the recording. It will be there. Um, but we're talking about uh, mechanicals and having practice tips. These are the Rage, uh, you know, practice tips. They're rounded. They're, they're not really, they're not sharp, but they look and have the same type of, uh, profile as what the rage does when it's when it's alive um, you know sharpened uh, broadhead all right so let's move on so other equipment um, I um, definitely would like to recommend that you you know if you're an art uh, hunter and you just want to get out in the field somehow and take a chance you, you don't really know how to hunt but setting up a uh, ground blind on a well-used game trail, you will be amazed at what type of wildlife you see throughout the day, uh, just sitting in that nice shaded, uh, secured uh, ground blind. If you have an opportunity to buy a ground blind, it, it's good for turkey hunting, it's good for deer hunting. Um, you might be able to get yourself a good opportunity at some deer. And especially if you've done your homework ahead of time and use some trail cams, uh, trail cameras, set up in that same area to, to see what kind of animals and, and wildlife are using that trail, if at all. Um, animals are very habitual. So you may have to note what time the period of activity is for that area and make sure you're in the blind, you know, way prior to that so that you can make sure you're not disrupting stuff. But sometimes if you have good trail cams and take pictures, you'll find that the activity is in that same area during the same time of uh, day and uh, you can pattern some of these animals. Uh, and if you're gonna be a, a, you know, go out and get it uh, guy, you're gonna need a good pack frame and some game care equipment. Be ready for a successful harvest, okay? Not only on your person, but at your truck, you know, have that cooler. Cause like somebody mentioned the hot weather that you encounter during the archery seasons, um, heat, dirt and moisture, what spoiled game uh, the quickest. So you wanna have an opportunity to cool that animal down. You don't wanna get it wet. You don't wanna throw it in ice, uh, ice water. You wanna maybe have some frozen jugs where you can manipulate it around the animal, the carcass, and not get it all full of water, okay? Um, anybody have anything they wanna to add to this little segment? 
Hey, Sean, uh, the pistol question came up. So I figured we should probably tackle that. All right. Uh, we always get asked that. This is actually a law that's changed in the last couple of years where they've altered some of it. Uh, just to answer the question, part of when you're archery hunting, you're, you're not hunting with a firearm, you're hunting with a bow. Um, a lot of people want a, the, the pistol in their possession for personal protection, either from predators or who knows what they come across in the woods. Um, the rule for a long time was nobody could have a uh, pistol with them unless they were a active or retired peace officer. And even then they can't use it to assist taking. Uh, recently, the Fish and Game Commission changed that law to allow for uh, someone to carry a concealable firearm when taking big game as long as it's not deer. So deer still is a, you can't have your, your pistol with you. Uh, you. The fact you may have a CCW isn't really relevant to this issue. It's not covered in the regulations. But so for deer hunting specifically, which is what we're talking about today, that's it's still a no go to have your pistol on you. And that was addressed recently and weighed the different factors by the commission. And they came. So if you're bear, bear hunting, elk hunting, pig hunting, yeah, you may be able to carry a pistol on you as long as you don't use it to take the deer or the or the big game you're hunting. But for deer, it, it's a no go still. Good. Good answer. Good job, Ian. <laughs> That is, that one comes up a lot. Uh, some people might see the other one where it talks about hunting uh, with, for small game. Um, you know, there, there are some laws out there, but make sure that with deer, that you have no firearm with you on an archery only season, unless you're a peace officer or a retired peace officer in good standing, okay? Yeah, okay, you. okay, so the guy just fired a trump card at you. What if you're hunting? Bear and deer at the same time. Then that's a no. That's a no. Okay. All right. There you go. All right. Hopefully that answers that uh, that individual's question. Yeah. If you're if you're deer hunting at all, it doesn't matter if you're bear hunting, pig hunting, all at the same time. It's no. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah. there was another question we didn't cover earlier. Someone was asking about the the sliding pin sticker scale sites. I'm not sure if Chris wants to speak up on that. I personally use a sliding five pin site that allows me to use a scaled sticker that's to the the ibo speed of my arrows allows me to both use pins i've set up for but also use the sticker that you put on that to put on a specific distance that if you choose it's a little technical to get set up they're quite a bit more expensive but they make them in one pin three pin and five pins and uh they're some people really, really like them, the ones that, that use them. Yeah, the, the, so I think the gentleman, uh, or whoever it is on there, was, was probably talking a little bit more. I don't, I'm not sure, maybe about the pendulum site. Uh, you know, again, a single pin in the optic with, you know, with a, a, again, a, a rounded uh, yardage uh, sticker on the side of it. It's going to allow you to adjust. I'm with Ian, uh, to be honest with you, I, I'm at Hillbilly Professor, I'm way too stupid to know how to adjust all that stuff with, on the fly. Um, so I just have the five pins on my side. Uh, again, three pins are a great way to get started. That'll give you plenty of opportunity at 20, 30, and 40 yards. Uh, five pins are good. Plenty of seven pin sites out there, and they're even ramming eight to 10 pins in these sites nowadays. It just depends on how fast your bow is and what you wanna do. Um, the one thing that was kind of iffy about the question on there we covered this last night but you know i just wanted to hit the garmin site there was a lot of question marks over the course of time the garmin site that does actually read you yardage okay it's going to give you your pin in the front and it's going to tell you in electronic digital numbers in the front what your yardage is it does cast a beam at the animal those are deemed legal in the state of california to use so if there's any question marks about using a garmin site or any yardage finding site you can use those but keep in mind for any uh, uh, organizations that recognize fair chase, such as Pope and Young, those are not legal. Uh, so please make sure that you read your regulations and your fair chase, depending on whether you want to uh, uh, enter a, a trophy animal into, into a record book. Uh, lighted sites are legal. Yes, they are. That was another one that popped up. Uh, you, you are allowed to have a pin light to light your pins, but it cannot cast a beam forward. Yep. 
So uh, Ian just answered questions. If, if it's not clear, you can carry a gun if you're hunting with a bow during the general season, as long as you don't have an archery only tag. If you have a general tag and you just prefer to hunt with your archery equipment, as long as you have, uh, you know, um, it's general season, as long as that firearm has the ammunition that would be legal to take that deer, uh, I guess you, well, no, you don't even have to have that. You, you can just have it because I'm making this more difficult, aren't I? And I'll just go with Ian's response. You can carry a firearm during the general season as long as you don't have an archery only tag. Okay, that's, that's the answer. All right. Uh, gentleman did ask here too about uh, shooting from inside a ground blind. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, please stay in the blind. Yeah. And um, if you're using the firearm for protection's sake, you can have lead in it. Um, it's just that you cannot finish the animal uh, with the pistol. You know, say, well, I got majority of it with the bow. Uh, I'm just finishing it off and it's a lead bullet. That's not legal. Okay. Uh, the, the firearm you're saying is for protection only. It's not for assisting and take. Uh, if you had uh, copper bullets in there, it would be okay. All right? Any uh, objections to that? No. Nope. Okay. One thing I'd throw out that I, I thought was interesting, I found out from Mike Norris uh, about two years ago. It may have changed since then. But uh, to the best of everyone's knowledge and record keeping, there's never been a hunter uh, truly attacked physically by a mountain lion. Uh, while he's been out hunting. So, you know, if, if, yeah. if everybody's fearful of mountain lions, don't get so panicked about mountain lions. Yeah. All right, so let's go about, let's let's figure out where we're gonna go. Where are the deer are? Come on, real quick, if we can go back to that last slide, I've got a couple of comments on that one. All right. Uh, touching back on the ground blind. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can shoot from inside of them. Just make sure that uh, if you're using traditional equipment that you've got the limb clearance. Uh, with the compounds, you got a much shorter wheel to wheel axle length. With long bows and recurves, you hit that top limb or the bottom limb on anything inside that ground blind, it's gonna throw your shot off. Yeah. And uh, the other thing is uh, game care. Uh, Ian talked about it last night in our practice session. And it, it's gonna be really hot this weekend. We're looking at 100, 607 in Lake County here. And uh, in order to keep animals cool, you have to think about how you're gonna treat that animal immediately uh, after take, are you going to be in the field for multiple days, or do you have a plan to get that animal field dressed, cooled down, and, and out of the field uh, relatively quickly? So, um, if you are going to be there for an extended period of time, a couple little tricks that uh, I shared in some cooler helps a lot. Uh, so, when you get that meat in there, you're good to go. Uh, and then, have just go to the Kmart and buy a really cheap sleeping bag. And uh, the coolest time of the day is right that moment just before the sun breaks the horizon, you know, that early morning chill. Um, hang your meat up overnight. And if you've never made an outback fridge, basically you don't want to get your meat wet, but you can drape a wet sheet around uh, your animal approximately six inches away. And as that air blows through that wet sheet on the meat, it keeps the meat a little bit cooler. And then in the morning, you take that cold meat stuff that in the sleeping bag, put that in the pre-cooled cooler and keep the cooler in the shade all day. And that sleeping bag will actually insulate the cold throughout the day as long as you keep that cooler in the shade. So that can extend your time in the field without having to boogie out of the field as quickly as possible. But uh, um, if you can get the animal field dressed, cooled off, cleaned up and, and out of the uh, woods, the sooner the better. Yeah. And think of maybe getting a, a block of, um um what's it called dry ice you know because then you could freeze it you know give it a good freeze when it gets back into the into your um, cooler all right um so we'll go here this picture actually is taken during archery season up in northern california uh this would be this would be the ideal thing to come across right guys uh all these bucks were sitting in the shade of a tree uh this is that bachelor group that's you know typical during the archery season they're all still in velvet um but basically you know when we're, we're looking for deer we're looking in low light periods of uh activity it's morning evenings maybe when clouds are present uh, might present higher periods of activity or if you get a significant drop where it's you know it's been really hot and 
you know, high 90s, low 100s, and then you get a day that's 84. You know, there might be more activity that comes out of, at that time. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of people in California that like to do the road hunting, right? I hate seeing it myself. I see it every year where there's a guy standing in the back with his bow on top of the, the cab of the truck. And, you know, they got their uh, wrist um, release on and you know, that's not a good deal, but um, you know, you can look, look for deer, maybe do your, you know, your spot and stock, but you're going to be more productive just looking on the ground, getting good sign of what's going on in the area and staying in those areas uh, to hunt. I'm sorry, got a message here. John, real quick, uh, one of the most common questions I get as a game warden is yes. where the deer at? <laughs> and my number one question is not where your car is. That's true. That's what I ask them. So when you're doing that pre-scouting, virtual scouting, look where there's water, look where there's things, but also look for roads and try and find where there's good legal access that you can get away from your vehicle, get out in the woods and experience it the way hunting you're supposed to, which is out, out on the feet on the ground, listening, walking quietly, observing, not drive until you see something, especially true with archery hunting. Uh, I mean, rifle guys do it all the time, but especially archery, you're not going to be successful in the seat, buckled up in the seat of your car. Yeah. So somebody uh, actually finally used our question and answer se uh, section, which thank you, Chase. Um, I'm answering this live. Okay. So, so he says early in the season, you're going to unlikely see bucks with those. Yes. If we do see does, how far will they be away from them? How about relating to proximity to water? So um, you're not always gonna see just does. You might see a yearling buck in there, which is awesome because those taste good. Um, but uh, most of the bucks, they're just gonna be, they're gonna be off, and, but they're gonna be relating to habitat that they want to, you know, to have everything that they need, they, the water, the feed, the, the cover, but they are gonna be, I, I would say not in close proximity, uh, but you just have to, you know, there's no reason for them to be around the does at that time of year. So don't look specifically for does to, to find bucks, right? Ian, you're the backcountry guy. How close in proximity do you find the, the bachelor herds? To the does? Yeah. Not, not very. Yeah. But usually when you do find them, you find the, the one or there's one, there's more than one buck yeah. back there. All right. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, I think that's good for that slide. Um, Here's where the deer located. Some of the things to think about as well is uh, when you're doing your scouting and you're looking at game tra trails and stuff like that that you see on the hills, don't expect deer to be standing on them in the middle of the day. If it's hot, they're going to be bedded down typically up, up overlooking the trail because they, you know, they're looking for predators walking the trail too. So you're not going to see them on the deer trail. They're going to be bedded down usually above that trail. And this is again, where those binoculars come in super handy. You're going to want to look into those shadows. And uh, when the bucks antlers are in velvet, they're not going to be in that heavy, hard thicket stuff because their antlers are sensitive. But once they shed that velvet, they'll be, or that velvet, they'll be right in the middle of the heaviest, densest thicket stuff and you'll you need to penetrate and look into those deep shadows yeah in order to pick those animals up well really quick i mean this isn't the focus but it's something that you should uh know because when you go out there deer hunting and you're in bear country because um typically they do use the same type of habitat uh if you acquire a bear tag it's almost guaranteed that you're not going to see a bear uh, if you don't have one, you're going to see all kinds of them. That's typically what happens, right, guys? Um, I one season saw 11 bears in a three-day hunt. Uh, didn't have a bear tag. The next year, I said, you know what? There was a lot of bears there. I'm going to go buy a bear tag. Next year, the three days, I didn't see a single bear. So it's up to you. Um, archery bear season does usually coincide and run with uh, our, the, the deer zones for archery. Archery bear season and all bear zones where you can legally lawfully take bear uh, runs from August 21 through September 12th, okay? But be sure that the area that you're in, if you have an X zone, uh, general deer, you know, bear season, they don't coincide all the time. So just really check your, just your zone to make sure that you're, uh, 
you're lawfully taking a bear. Um, you're only allowed one adult bear per hunting license season. Any cubs or females accompanied by cubs are off limits, you can't take them, okay? And a cub is defined as a bear less than one year of age or bears weighing less than 50 pounds, okay? So think of your, your uh, little, you know, your dog, whatever dog you may have, maybe a Labrador that's a small lab. If it's smaller than that, your dog at home, then you shouldn't be shooting at it, okay? And then also, uh, no person may take a bear within 400 yard radius of a dump or a bait. And that goes for deer too. You can't hunt with the, uh, using bait. And bait, what is bait? Bait, uh, Mike, you want to cover bait? You probably had some baiting cases in your area before. Yeah, basically bait is any type of attractant that uh, they can taste, uh, lick, you know, consume or anything like that. Anything that's going to artificially draw an animal into an area uh, that they wouldn't naturally uh, occur in. So that's pretty much, uh, it can be, it can be gels, it can be liquids, it can be uh, grains, it can be all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. Salts, uh, yeah, anything that uh, mm -hmm. attracts is considered a bait and you cannot hunt within a 400 yard radius of it. And if you're the one actually putting it out there, and saying, well, I'm not 400, you know, I'm not hunting within 400 yards, it's still considered a violation because you're not allowed to feed big game animals or uh, cause disruptions to their, hab their habits. Okay. All right. Next slide. So also you need to be ready for a quail, grouse, and tree squirrel. Um, the seasons for those coincide a lot with archery season. Um, Quail and blue or rough grouse uh, opens August 21st and goes to September 10th. Um, I can't see what the squirrel season is. It's a little bit earlier. My, my, my screen's getting covered by it. Um, but anyways, be aware that those opportunities are available for you out there. Um, carry yourself a nice judo tip or a blunt tip. I have one here. Uh, you can see if you don't not looking at Basically a judo tip is really, it's the same size uh, mass as my regular broadhead. It's just blunt here and it has these little prongs to keep you from losing the arrow if you miss. So the prongs on here, and actually there's some rabbit hair because the last thing I shot with this was a cotton tail. But uh, shooting, shooting a small game like that with these little things, great practice. They're tasty critters. You might need something for camp and uh, a fun way to, to enjoy part of your hunt. You can see here in this picture on the slide, that's actually my son with his first uh, bow kill, which was a mountain quail that he, that he got with his bow. So kind of a fun thing to do, good practice and a good opportunity for other animals while you're out hunting. So in the field, uh, the key to getting a deer in archery season is cutting the distance to the animal uh, without being detected. Uh, you, you want the shot within your effective range. We talked about that earlier. Not taking a shot outside of your effective range and wounding an animal without recovery. That would be the worst thing to do. And probably Ian and Mike can probably tell you stories that uh, sometimes we contact archers in the field, say, man, I stuck like three deer already this year and I haven't found one. Uh, that is like disgusting to me. Um, to me, if I shot an animal and I knew it was a wounding shot that uh, might cause the deer to die, I'm done. Uh, if I don't recover that animal, I'm done for the season. I'm not going to go out and try to stick another. Uh, the other thing that some of these people are doing is they're not practicing enough. If you're telling me that you shot three animals and you weren't able to recover them, you're not making accurate shots or you're outside of your effective range. So don't, don't get into that thing. Think about that. Think about, hey, I got an opportunity, I messed it up, um, you know, whatever may, might have happened. Uh, don't go out and stick more animals without practice. Uh, wait until next season, all those different things. So when we're hunting, keep uh, downwind of the animal you're pursuing. Don't get upwind of them. The smell is their best, uh, you know, defense. They can smell you, they'll be gone, okay? Try to stay concealed. Uh, you know, using shadows, those really help. Uh, using cover as much as you can. Maybe determine the direction of the animal's travel so that you can anticipate their travel across your path. Uh, but sometimes that requires patience. 
And I'll tell you, I don't know if these guys have this problem or not, but patience is my hardest part when it comes to hunting and pursuing animals. I want to, you know, do it. And sometimes you end up pushing an animal faster than you really want to. And if you would have just sat and wait, your opportunity would have came. Um, and then be ready for that, you know, awkward shot. If you had practiced it, kneeling, you know, being ducked down both knees, whatever it might be, where your window, your shot window is there. And if you've practiced it, you can make an effective shot, uh, you'll have success. Uh, anything you guys want to tell, a good story regarding any of these types of things? Mike? Uh, I've got I've got some more tips. Um, I, mean, I tell stories about dropping arrows on my toes and stuff like that. But uh, um, yeah, when stalking, you, you want to try to avoid that side to side movement. That's what gives you a way as far as movement goes. If you watch predators in the, uh, in the natural world, typically they do a straight line approach and that's going to minimize that side to side movement that catches the, the quarry's eyes. Um, you, obviously you want to avoid, uh, skylining yourself as well. It's a big mistake. A lot of new hunters make, um, and then as far as the final approach and stuff like that, you're going to want to go slow, like you said, Sean, and, uh, you might want to consider taking off your shoes, walking in, uh, socks or even bare feet and, uh, having a set of, uh, knee pads and gloves to, you know, get down as low as possible and, and make that final approach as, as quietly as, as you can. Um, you know, you can't control the wind. Uh, you can play the wind as best as you can, but, uh, you know, 90% of the, the, the hunting aspect for me is how close can I get to the animal? That's the challenge. That's the fun part. And, and even a blown stock uh, can still be one of the most rewarding uh, days in the field, even if you don't get the shot off. So um, yeah. those little things that you can do to try and um, make that final approach. Instead of just stepping on grasses, sweeping the grass aside with the edge of your foot and, and gradually laying that grass down instead of just crunching through it uh, will help a lot as, as far as uh, the sound that you're making on your approach as well. Great. Yeah. There's two, uh, two things in there that's, and actually it's interesting, Mike brings that up. It's a couple of things that uh, are in that, the, uh, the great Fred Bear's 10 commandments, never step on anything that you can step over. And, uh, you know, the, the key to hunting is being able to uh, basically sit, sit down, sit still, and be quiet. Yeah. And that is, you say it down there at the bottom, which is, you know, be patient. And a lot of people have a hard time with that. And I got to tell you, if you're tree stand hunting, that's exactly, you know, just sit down and be quiet. And a lot of people think, well, I am being quiet. Well, well you're not. <laughs> yeah. You know, you got you to gotta learn how to be quiet. And, and I, will, I will reiterate what Mike said. Some of my best archery hunts were archery hunts where I didn't kill anything, but we had so many opportunities. The, the stocks were there that we had a, a great week where we had so many opportunities for stocks. And that was where the fun was. We never pulled back, uh, you know, we never released an arrow, but we had so many stocking opportunities that that was what was fun about the whole trip. So I agree with you. All right. And uh, just talking about Fred Bear, remind me, you know, you talk about stopping often and you guys can do this. And the next time you go to the park or you're walking through a, a treed area, just take, take a good look around, see what you can see where you're currently standing. And then just take three steps forward and look around and look at the different perspective that you have just from those three steps. If you're blasting through the woods super fast, you're going to miss a lot of those deer tails, those uh, ear flickers and stuff like that. Just take a couple, four or five steps, stop and look around at that different perspective that you have. And you might get that piece of an animal that uh, you're not going to spook out of that area um, before just, you know, exposing yourself completely and making a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. All right. Shot placement. Um, I didn't show anything besides like the two, uh, you know, most recommended shots, uh, which would be um, basically broadside or quartering away. These are typical, uh, you know, the primary uh, shots you want to take quartering away because the deer's looking away. Maybe it's been feeding. It's opened up. It's basically, you know, you have a great chance there for vital areas, a vital hit, a uh, lung, liver, heart area up towards the front of it. Uh, same thing with the broadside. You know, you have that aiming of the, the back of the front legs, you know, a perfectly 
perpendicular animal, you follow up the back leg of that animal and pick a small spot and, and release and, and hopefully you, you're on target. But uh, very important that you understand that you're killing this animal not through shock like you do with a rifle, but with hemorrhaging, that your razor sharp broadheads are gonna be slicing uh, vital areas, vital organs on the way through the animal and hopefully you get full penetration and uh, exit on the other side so that that animal can then lose that blood and uh, no longer carry on. So um, very, very important that you can use that uh, bow that has enough poundage that you have your razor sharp broadheads, you get a good penetration, maybe completely pass through and that way you can have a good blood trail to, to follow. Um, I know we talked about this yesterday, gentlemen, about the bows. Uh, you want to go ahead and expand on that just a little bit. We're, we're getting towards the end, but I just want somebody to cover that really quick. Chris, you had some good stuff about that yesterday. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, but again, bows? The bows, the, the minimal weight uh, poundage, the 30 pounds. Oh, uh, well, yeah, the, um, the 30 pound uh, limit came up. Uh, obviously, the old rule, as a lot of people do, was, uh, was a little bit silly. Uh, it was, uh, you know, and I, I, I often vision somebody, it was a game warden trying to chase down an arrow that had gone 130 yards and how quick the guy that shot the arrow to test it would run away. Um, but that being said, they changed the uh, rule a couple of years ago. Uh, I guess it was last year, uh, to the 30, 30 pound bow. Um, I just recommend to people, um, you, you know, again, if you're going to shoot a 30 pound bow, it goes right back to what we talked about earlier with making sure it's fit properly and you've got a properly spined arrow, properly weighted arrow. Uh, there's been plenty of people that have killed a lot of deer with a, a 30 pound compound bow without too much difficulty. Um, and again, with a 30 pound recurve as well, but it's all about shot placement. Uh, it's gonna be about using the proper equipment, proper fitted equipment, which you can get at your, at your local archery pro shops and then uh, making sure that you're placing a good shot. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, the, the, the bows can, the 30 pound bow will kill plenty of stuff. It's got to make yep. sure you're shooting in the right direction. And that goes back to what we just showed there on that last slide with the, with the quartering or away shot and the shot play. That's right. my two cents worth. Good. Hey, Ian, would you go ahead and go over a blood trailing for us? Um, you know, you see what I have here on the slides. Of, I'm sure you've probably. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, I've had to have some very long blood trails before because with archery, it, like you mentioned, Sean, it's a different method of how it how the deer dies, and depending upon how it's hit, where it's hit. Um, I remember shooting a deer that I knew was a good shot, double lung through shot, and I went to go blood trail it after waiting good forty five minutes, and there was not a single mark of blood anywhere. And I started that stress was getting to my mind of oh no, have I have I ruined this hunt? Have I injure this deer am I not going to recover it I start doing concentric circles my head's down staring for blood can't find any blood anywhere I finally look up the deer was no more than 50 yards from where I shot it hmm. but it it, it filled it went and it was a through and through shot filled up both lungs and it died foaming in the mouth 50 yards from it but there's no blood trail on that deer and I've had ones where I followed the blood trail for half of a mile before, and it's I've done the with a friend, with uh, there's different ways you can do it. One I like is like uh, engineer surveyor's flags. We got a stack of like a hundred of them and we're on our hands or knees looking for a little pinprick of blood on a leaf or wherever. And you mark the last place you found the blood and you just leave a flag pointed every time you get to a new speck of blood further down the way. And sometimes you can't see blood anywhere and you're like, okay, what happened here? And then you start just Looking at the train, like where would an injured deer go here? Well, there's a trail that way. That's uphill, probably downhill. That or you just try and figure out. And so it's it sometimes it can be several hours. Sometimes if if you're in a bad situation trying to find it. And like I mentioned before, we've had it where it only went a few yards and I just had to look up and see it. So don't be the guy that shoots a deer, follow the blood for 25 yards. Oh, the blood trail will dry it up, I'm done and leave. I've, I've had success where I found it later in the night with a flashlight using blood trails. It 
bed it, it went to 400 tree, bed it down and died. But it took me quite a while to find it on my hands and knees with pinpricks of blood to get me there. I'm not sure if you need anything else on technique there. No, uh, you know, like here, I don't know if the, you know, if you, the second bullet, we're talking about finding the arrow and sometimes there's clues to your shot placement on that arrow. You know, you might see this, um, um, you know, that there's some material in that blood, which would maybe lead to you that you gut shot that animal. So that there's some clues there and you want to recover that arrow also too, just to make sure that, hey, the, all the broadheads are still here, you know, all the blades, uh, because that's something con to consider when you're going to um, clean your animal is, hey, are there any blades missing from my arrow that uh, I need to be wary about? You know, um, those, those blades can travel off, off of the path of the arrow and into different parts of the meat. So you want to be careful there. Um, but yeah, just be persistent. Um, mark your spots. Always mark that last spot that you saw some blood because, you know, you might have to leave the field. You might have to go, you know, back home and leave that animal out overnight and come back and try to, to pick up that trail. So you want to say, you don't want to guess that, hey, this is where I think my last trail was. You want to know. So make sure that you do that. All right. And another little tool that you can have is, you know, those little uh, pump bottles, spray bottles, little small ones. You have, have it filled with uh, hydrogen peroxide, and that'll help identify blood versus other red uh, specks on the ground that you're not sure if it's blood or not. Spray a little peroxide on there. If it bubbles up, you know you got blood and you're good to go. Yeah, so that's a good little thing to have maybe in your kit for trailing is a little spray bottle, a mister type of uh, peroxide. Um, peroxide, once it comes in contact with the blood, you'll get some bubbling. You'll, you'll be able to differentiate blood versus something else. All right. Hey, uh, real, real quick too on that uh, recovery thing. I hate to be that uh, trophy guy, but uh, do keep in mind too, when it comes down to blood trailing, when you're trailing them, uh, when it comes down to uh, your trophy organizations, if you, give up the, if you give up the chase, okay, and go in and, and hit the camp for the night, give up the chase, come back the following day, you're jeopardizing your, uh, your fair chase uh, affidavit for things like hope and young. So again, I know that's, arrogant and egotistical, we're worried about finding the animal here, but you know, if you guys are trophy hunters, uh, you may want to definitely make sure you're following yeah. fair chase. Or not. Great. So upon finding your animal, make sure it is dead, you know, make sure you uh, check that the chest isn't moving prior to your final approach, tag the animal and take your pictures in that order, please. We have to hear a lot of different things where, hey, this guy, you know, He's taking pictures and his tag, his deer's not tagged, and and that's a violation, which it is. Okay, um, I don't know what the big deal is about having a tag uh, visible on a, on a deer that you just you know harvested, um, but please tag it first, take your pictures, and uh, get ready to pack it out. Now the work starts. You have to go out there and you have to figure out your method of cleaning. There's different methods that are out there on the internet, but the biggest thing is you want to get that animal cooled as soon as possible. Cooling it, uh, getting that hide off, getting the entrails out of the animal, uh, get it cooled off as soon as you can, and, and get ready to pack out whatever you can uh, and secure whatever's left that when you come back in, it's not going to be uh, you know, fed on by other types of things out there. You just want to make sure you're securing it and be aware that you know most of California, as soon as you kill an animal and uh, there's blood on the ground, you're going to have meat bees, you know, there's almost no way you can avoid it. Uh, they're irritating. Uh, they're those, one of those things that just always around, even in colder times of year. Um, get your, be aware that any little fly or thing you might think of as a uh, fly, it could be a meat bee and you might be in for an unpleasant surprise. But also make sure you take all usable meat, okay? You don't want to get lazy and leave uh, front shoulders in the field because there's not much meat on them or you know uh, you don't like the, the way it tastes. Um, if you fail to bring out all usable meat, uh, you could be side for uh, wasting game. All right, and that is it. So we have covered a lot tonight, gentlemen. I really do appreciate what we've done. 
Uh, we still have a lot of our participants on board, so they're they're all here. They're enjoying it. And uh, I don't know, was there any questions that I missed that uh, need to be covered? Robert, I didn't look at all the questions. Yeah, cover that last one. He wants to know where advanced bow hunter education clinics will be located. Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, haven't got the green light to go with, a, with live in-person clinics yet. Um, I am hoping to have them all throughout the state. Recently, I pulled all of our hunter ed instructors who are uh, what their, you know, what their expertise is. And we hope to have many offerings as soon as we can get the green light to go. So um, if you as a participant have knowledge of a good uh, location to teach, please reach out to me. Uh, if there's a good facility or venue that would be good for hosting a, uh, you know, archery clinic, reach out to me. Um, there's a survey on the Advanced Hunter Ed webpage that you can fill out and anything, any additional comments that you have, please put them in there. I, I look at those, I read them. Actually, I owe some, some uh, prizes for participation on there. I like to send people who give me good um, advice or good remarks about stuff, um, you know, reward you for participating because ultimately our program wants to help you out to become successful, knowledgeable, and responsible hunters. And we want to help you get there. And that's what our goal is. So that's what we're here for tonight. We're trying to give you uh, a little bit of confidence to go out there and try archery hunting. My panelists, they've done a great job. Uh, my presenters, they've done a great job of sharing this stuff with you. Um, Thank you for participating, but uh, please join us next time for our uh, A-Zone, public A-Zone opportunities, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, panel. Good night. Good luck. Be out there. Good night, guys.